Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our first Aspen Germany uh, COVID-19 and tech series uh, that we are doing in partnership with uh, Google. We are delighted to have everyone here. We have currently 80 participants on the line in various 82 participants uh, in various forms, either uh, on their computers or dialing in. Uh, and we are delighted to have you all here. Um, I know we're all getting used to our COVID-19 reality. And of course that involves a lot of teleconferencing systems. And for us, uh, our poison of choice is Zoom in this case. Many of you guys know it, uh, but bear with us as we try to make sure we get the technical issues uh, handled and taken care of. Uh, my name is Tyson Barker and I'm the Deputy Executive Director of Aspen Germany here in Berlin. I also head our tech program and our transatlantic program and I am going to uh, uh, talk us through this, this first session with Sir Julian King, the former Commissioner for the Security Union. But before I introduce uh, the ambassador, um, I want to uh, provide a couple of ground rules. Uh, first of all, as you guys know, Zoom, uh, there can be technical difficulties. I would recommend if you do have connection issues, try to disconnect and reconnect um, as a first line of, of resilience. We're all building resilience into our lives. Uh, second of all, so that you guys know, this is on the record. Uh, so anything that is said by uh, uh, Sir Julian or anybody else can be quoted and cited. Uh, third, we are definitely wanting to be tech first in all of our, uh, our communications. So we are doing uh, Twitter as well. We are tweeting under the hash hashtag Aspen Tech 20, which you guys might have seen in the invitation um, and in the splash page before. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, we are doing this in partnership with Google. We are so delighted that Google was uh, willing to join with us. And I think everybody knows that Google is really at the front lines of this fight, trying to bring uh, tech solutions to bear on uh, managing resilience and democratic readiness in COVID-19, be it in artificial intelligence, be it in the fight against disinformation, uh, supporting small businesses, et cetera. So we're really glad to have them on board. Um, just a couple things. We have people calling in on regular phones and we have people who are on their computers. Uh, we're going to start with some discussion just with uh, uh, Sir Julian and myself, but later we are going to have the opportunity for questions and answers. So if you are here uh, on your computer, all you have to do is raise your hand, push the raise hand icon, uh, and we will get to your question or you can type your question into Q&A and I will read it for Sir Julian. If you are dialing in on your phone, uh, you will have to push star nine, that's star nine, and it will prompt us and we'll make sure we get to your questions. For everybody on both sides, please do identify yourself, name and affiliation so that we know who we are speaking to. All right, and let's, uh, let's get started with no further ado. So uh, again, like I said, we wanted to start this talking about how tech is really managing, supporting, and challenging uh, us all in this crisis with COVID-19. And one of the questions we had was the whole question around democratic resilience and readiness. Uh, and we couldn't have thought of a better person to have for our first speaker, uh, Sir Julian King, who is currently a fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute, but has been uh, European Commissioner for the Security Union from 2016 to 2019, um, and is really a diplomat's diplomat. He was British ambassador to Ireland and to France, and has basically been watching um, the national security and prosperity space internationally, how Europe is engaging with the world for 20 years, uh, dealing with NATO, the EU. You, CSDP, et cetera. Um, our discussion, we don't want to take everything. Tech and COVID-19 is a lot. Um, we're kind of focusing on four slices, I think. Uh, disinformation, cybersecurity, geo-tracking and privacy, and then the supply chain question. So those are kind of what we're going to be focusing on on this first part of our discussion. Um, and Julian, let me just start with a uh, kind of a broad question. Your, your successor at the commission, uh, Vice President Chinas, uh, had remarks on Sunday where he said, we have all learned anew what the luxury of the mundane has allowed us to neglect. Uh, individual responses do not work. Sticking together optimizes all our chances of beating this thing. Um, how would you assess, assess how we're doing on that? 
Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to be with you. I'm very happy to be a, a guinea pig for your uh, new series. Uh, and uh, I'm very glad that you've chosen this subject to, to kick off. Uh, we're going to home in on some of the issues around tech in, in particular, but perhaps uh, more generally in response to that uh, quote that you just uh, read out, which I agree with, uh, I think we have with the virus very clearly a challenge that doesn't uh, that doesn't discriminate between countries and doesn't respect borders, uh, and that is that is difficult because with health, a little bit like some aspects of security, uh, countries, member states, the European Union tend to keep their cards very close to their chest. I mean, it's organized very often at a national level or, or at a regional level. Uh, many of the levers are traditionally national levers. Uh, and we saw some of that, I thought, in the very early days with things like um, some countries taking export restrictions on, on um, personal protection equipment and seeing that actually that didn't work out so great in all cases. Mm. And quite quickly, a bit like some of the security issues over recent years, I think that governments are coming to understand that you do need here an element of cooperation, an element of joint working to complement the work that you're going to be doing nationally or regionally. Uh, and I think that that is, that's an, it's an important lesson. I'm glad we're learning it. Uh, it's going to be very relevant to some of the tech issues that we're going to go on to talk about. But it's also relevant to managing the crisis now and to thinking about how we can get out of it uh, at the end of this challenge. Uh, it's, uh, I'm glad to say, led to some, some concrete um, actions collectively and from, from the Commission. Uh, I don't work for the Commission anymore, but I'm very glad to recognize when they do mm -hmm. good things. So I think what the uh, European Central Bank's done, what some of the things the Commission has done around how the the Stability and Growth Pact is going to work, but also some of the concrete measures that the Commission is now leading on, uh, whether that is uh, looking at how to use some grants and some funding to help countries with particular challenges, whether that is equipment challenges or hospital challenges or transport challenges, uh, help with um, sporting repatriation flights, uh, help with acting as a kind of clearinghouse for organizing joint procurement activities. Again, working together in many cases gives you extra heft and gets you results. Uh, and I, I think that those lessons are gonna be very important to hold on to. Also, when we come to some of these tech challenges, we're definitely gonna to have to work together to manage them effectively. And when we think of the future and coming out of this crisis, uh, we must all look ahead all the time. Uh, I think there are gonna be some, there are gonna be some real challenges, uh, which we're gonna to have to uh, work through uh, together. Many people have speculated that this is going to raise some questions about how we organize our societies, uh, how open we are to continued globalization, uh, how open we are to, to China uh, and the role of the state. And I think we have to work through those kind of big issues together if we're going to manage them effectively. When it comes to the tech issues, because quite obviously this is massively accelerating the move online of witness today, uh, we are going to have to work at maintaining trust and confidence. Because if we don't maintain trust and confidence, we can't make the shift online work effectively. Uh, and that trust and confidence comes at all sorts of different levels. It's around uh, believing in the benefits that movie online can generate, but it's also about mitigating the problems. So content, harmful content, what are we going to do about it, uh, abuse, whether that is criminal or political, and how can we better secure our systems, the way we work, and uh, our infrastructure, the fundamental plumbing that we rely upon to live our lives online. And these are absolutely key issues that I believe we can only make progress on working together. Oh, well, you, you've raised a lot of very important strategic issues that I think we're going to be dealing with definitely, if not during the crisis, then certainly after the crisis, the, the hitting the, the uh, rocket propulsion system on moving to tech, tech first, uh, globalization, China, big questions. Uh, but let me ask you a question that's very acute right now, and it deals with this issue of trust and confidence. Um, the, the, the WHO said, in addition to dealing with a 
a pandemic, we're also dealing with an infodemic right now, uh, that a lot of narratives are developing uh, globally, um, and we're seeing new trends in disinformation and fake news. And, and I wanna ask you a question about that, but before I do, I actually want to uh, put up a poll that we wanna ask our, our participants to engage in. Uh, the commission has identified some disinformation, some prominent disinformation narratives, and I'm gonna read through them. But what we wanna ask our, our participants, and unfortunately those who are calling in can't participate, but we'll read it out loud, is which disinformation narratives do you think will prove most effective in Europe? And there are six examples here uh, that the commission has identified as, as prominent. Uh, the first is COVID-19 did not originate in China. The US is concealing its true origins. The second is that the outbreak has, caused, uh, has been caused by migrants and migrants are spreading the virus in the EU. The third is that the coronavirus is linked to 5G. The fourth is that the commission, or excuse me, the EU has failed to handle the crisis. The EU is a disaster for Europe. Uh, the fifth is China is coming to the rescue uh, of the EU as Brussels abandons EU member states. And the sixth and final is uh, the coronavirus is a hoax. Uh, it is not serious as, as serious as elites claim. Uh, and while our, our uh, participants are answering this question so we can see the poll results, uh, Sir Julian, I wanna ask you, what do you see as some of the intent behind some of this disinformation and how do you see patterns of its spreading changing in this crisis? Well, this is a, this is a challenge. I think we're all living with it. Uh, the, there's a lot of misinformation, first of all, which is often innocent. Uh, this is, I, I'm not saying it's human nature, but when people are concerned, they uh, can reach for any bit of information that apparently gives comfort. And that leads to quite a lot of um, misinformation circulating, but there is also obviously some more intentional disinformation. Uh, some of that is, is being generated domestically, some of that, uh, and I have to give a shout out here for the um, EU Stratcom team who've been, who've been mapping some of this, and I think their work may lie behind some of your, some of your quotes that you've just given. Uh, there is definitely uh, an emerging pattern of uh, pro-Kremlin source disinformation, and indeed, uh, some of it's very public, uh, of, of, of pro-China disinformation. Uh, and I, I think we should be naive about that. Uh, EU Stratcom have mapped, I think, uh, recently 150 cases of pro-Kremlin uh, disinformation. Some examples you've just given, uh, it, it's man-made or it was US-made. Anyway, it's got nothing to do with us. Uh, and that the uh, West or the EU are in all sorts of a mess. Again, you know, until recently, that was uh, in contrast to the uh, handling in Russia. That, that particular narrative doesn't look so good right now. Uh, and on the China side, uh, they are doing uh, a number of things quite openly with government spokespeople doing it in a number of cases. Uh, one seems to be uh, to try and uh, blur a little bit the possible origins of this problem. So there's quite a lot of conspiracy theories on the origins being peddled from Chinese sources. It may come from the US or it may come from Italy or who knows. And they're also uh, very openly uh, pursuing a, what you might call a politics of generosity approach, i.e. China's done well, we're now able to help other people and here's a plane load of stuff that we're flying into uh, country X. And they're not only pursuing that in Europe, they're pursuing that uh, around the world, in Africa and elsewhere, in a way that supports and complements other policies, which they pursue perfectly openly uh, around uh, Belt and Road. We, we, we shouldn't be naive about that, uh, and we yeah. should work out our responses. Some of those responses will be political. Uh, some of those responses need to be more technical, working in particular with the platforms. We, we, we have the results of the poll. Um, and maybe we can just go to that really quickly. Very interesting to see where people have landed. Lots of distribution, but it's, there are two clear, uh, let's say leads, I don't wanna say winners, but uh, uh, two areas where uh, our participants, and we're now at 126 participants, see that the, the 
disinformation campaigns are most effective. The first, and this is with 40, 44% of participants, over 40 participants, um, said that the EU has failed to handle the crisis. The EU is a disaster for Europe. That's 44% say that this is an, an effective narrative. And the second, 31% say China is coming to the rescue as the EU abandons uh, EU member states, or as Brussels abandons EU member states. So this idea of China uh, swinging in to be a kind of hero, the cowboy coming to the rescue, is, is, really, is really taking root in some ways. Um, let me ask you something about the, the vectors of disinformation spread. Um, what do you see with WhatsApp and what do you see specifically with audio snippets? I've read a lot about the use of audio snippets, people having conversations or um, segments of conversations spreading through private WhatsApp groups. Is this something new and how can the EU and its member states fight against this and, and maybe uh, tech companies as well? So can I start where you finished? Uh, I sure. think that there are, there are some political narratives which you've just covered, which need to be countered with uh, politically uh, managed counter narratives and political action. Uh, and I'm glad to say that now the European Union is, uh, as we were discussing at the start, getting its act together and is demonstrably helping uh, the member states uh, more effectively. Uh, and that is part of the response. But we also need a technical response, working in particular with the platforms. Uh, the, the platforms deserve some credit, I think. And it's not just because uh, Google have very happily helped us with today's uh, exercise. Uh, but some of the big platforms have been um, active in pushing out and underlining some of the good sources of information. In particular, they, they back some of the WHO information on this, which I think helps debunk some of these, um, some of these pieces of disinformation that are circulating. And a number of the platforms, Facebook to name one, have been more active on this than on some other issues, including issues I've had with them in the past, uh, on, on taking stuff down. Uh, they've actually publicly declared, of course, that they're gonna take down uh, any claims that are designed to discourage treatment or, or discourage people from taking precautions. So I think we have to recognize that the platforms are engaging on this, again, more than they have on some other issues of concern in the past. But the challenges remain. Um, how are they doing it? What is, the, what is the explanation and the policy that they are pursuing in identifying material and taking it down? How are they doing it? What is the transparency around it? Uh, and there we've, we've had some issues. Uh, and how are we going to monitor how effective this action is as, as we all go forward through this? So uh, transparency on how they're doing it, well, I'm afraid that Twitter, for example, is still allowing the Chinese MFA to say some pretty uh, uh, slanted things on this. Uh, there is a question around uh, how much AI is being used to do the filtering. Uh, and again, I think we need to have a, we need to have a discussion about that. Uh, and when it comes to effectiveness, you raised one particular concern, which is um, private uh, Facebook groups. When we say private, of course, they can be very, very large. Uh, and what is, what is the possibility to monitor the messaging that's going around on, on those groups? So there are still some questions that we need to, to pursue with the platforms. Uh, building on some of the stuff that we've already done on the, the code of practice on tackling disinformation, I think when it comes to this particular challenge, we need to redouble our efforts to get the platforms to promote factual information, to cooperate with fact checkers. There's a very active community of fact checkers who are now focusing on, on, on COVID, uh, to be as open as they can be about how, they're, how they are identifying and taking down uh, material and what their record is on that. When they take down material, they should be ready to share it with the public authorities and with mm. independent uh, researchers. They should be very active on corrections. I think that matters in this case even more than in some of the other cases, like um, some of the terrorism challenges that we've had in the past, because we need to let people know when they've been following false information. Uh, and crucially, for the platforms and for the advertisers, we have to make sure that we're not monetizing any of this. There are still ads running against stuff that is patently untrue around the virus, and, and that's not good enough. 
Yeah, yeah. Demonetizing is, is probably a really important piece of this because even if you're talking about, uh, let's say, any kind of disinformation, we have to drain the incentive structure uh, that would encourage people to put up clickbait, especially if it's disinformation. I completely agree. Um, one of the big debates we're having here in Germany, you know, everybody's looking at South Korea. Everybody's, a lot of people are looking at Taiwan. They're saying what has worked in, in these countries. And one of the the things that people are pointing to is the use of geolocation uh, to identify um, where infective people have been and who they've been in contact with. And there have been talks, and obviously countries have adopted it, to use cell phone data, for example in Israel, to alert people uh, that infected individuals have been in touch with and send them text messages, for example, to self-isolate. Very controversial. Uh, how do you see that debate here in, in Europe uh, playing out? Well, I think it's important that we're having the debate. Uh, it, it is, it seems to me, uh, essential that we work on a range of policy issues that are going to allow us to move out of um, lockdown situations into situations where we are testing and tracking. Uh, and technology will have a role to play in that. Uh, the precise role and how we want to see technology play that role is something that we need to debate and we need to debate it publicly uh, starting right now. Uh, it's not just geolocation. I'll come back to that. Uh, it's also uh, the role of uh, facial recognition and possibly other AI applications that could, could be used to um, help you to understand what's going on in terms of uh, the nature and the scope of, of uh, infections and the effectiveness of, of your quarantine measures. On geolocation, because there's a lot of it in the news at the moment, uh, I think that uh, we need to develop this debate further, but as a rule of thumb, if you're aggregating and anonymizing the information to give you an overall picture, uh, I have less concern about that. It's as you break stuff down and make it more granular and personal that you really, really have to uh, ask some hard questions about what is being done, uh, the degree of transparency uh, and oversight, and obviously uh, consent and engagement in whatever uh, is being proposed. But on the aggregate use of uh, anonymized uh, geolocation uh, uh, information, uh, I think that uh, that can help you. It can help you with, as, as they sometimes say, the cartography of understanding where masses and groups of people are and what their movement is. That's very useful early on. But a as you go into a lockdown situation, it, it, it's kind of less useful information because you right. should know where people are. It becomes useful again, potentially, later, if you're trying to lift lockdowns and mm -hmm. uh, have movement. So uh, I think we need to continue to have that discussion. We need to have some rules of the road. But I, I personally, others involved in this conversation may feel differently. I, I'm not scandalized by that sort of use of um, information. Uh, I do think that when it comes to following individuals and getting information on them, on their health, uh, and how they feel, that is potentially very useful, but has to be done in a completely transparent way, which has full consent of the individual and of wider society. 